Fraser Bullock, COO, CFO of the 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake and now on the Olympic Exploratory Committee for 2030. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Wonderful to be here, Bob. What has Utah gained since the 2002 Olympics because of the Games and why should the Games come back to Utah in 2030? Well, one of the great things is we all were so enamored by the games. Everybody became engaged. It energized our city and created indelible memories forever. On top of that, we had, as indicated by the Hinckley Institute for Public Policy, a $6 billion impact to our economy. So we not only had a great event, we had a great economic outcome and hosting the world we became on the world's radar in terms of Salt Lake and Utah, a wonderful community. So why should they come back in 2030? Well, we have a new generation. This would be, if it is 2030, it would be 28 years since hosting the games. And we have a new generation of people to experience the game. My grandchildren, it would be wonderful for them. But beyond that, it, we are a great example to the Olympic movement because our venues are active. We have athletes training here. We have development programs for our kids. And bringing the games back here with such a great legacy is a perfect story for the Olympic movement. Toward the end of last year, Salt Lake was named by the USOC as the bid city for 2030. And Salt Lake beat Denver. Tell me about that process and how that all came about. What was it that Salt Lake had that Denver did not have? Well, just to be clear, it, we are America's choice for a future winter games. We're hopeful it's 2030, but that has, is yet to be defined. Now, in that process, we actually had Reno Tahoe and Denver and Salt Lake City. And we went through a process where they gave us this incredible questionnaire, a workbook they wanted drafted. It was hundreds of pages of technical work, all the venues, which we uh, answered every single question extraordinarily well. And then they visited us for a day. And the visit was amazing because they could see, whoa, it's only 20 minutes from Park City to Salt Lake. That is highly unusual. And seeing all those venues, seeing the people, reading our technical report, they said, this is the spot because nobody else has what we have here in infrastructure and experience. What kind of technical questions did they ask in that survey? Well, they asked us about our vision, our reason for hosting the games. They wanted letters of support from every single competition and non-competition venue. They wanted driving distances. They wanted specifications for each of the venues and how we would work them, overlay for, uh, for the Olympics. It was very comprehensive. And we came out shining because not only do we have our venues, our transportation infrastructure is even better than before. We have a new airport coming online. So as well as we did in, 20, in 2002, wow, we have even more to offer for 2030 or a future date. 2030 is 11 years away, and we assume that most of, if not all of, the previous venues will be used in the games in that time. What has yet to be done to be prepared for 11 years from now? Well, there are several things. Number one is the venues, in some cases, need to be refreshed a little bit in terms of maintenance and things like that. We would have to put all the contracts in place for all the venues, real estate we need for areas like parking lots, but 30,000 hotel rooms we have to have under contract for the game. So there's a lot of contractual work that has to be put in place. But overall, infrastructure, all there. Venues, all there. So for us, there are no significant expenditures other than the operating costs of hosting the games. I don't mean to hammer on this, but I'm going to ask one more question in regard to Denver, and that's this. In Denver's proposal, they included uh, the idea that athletes travel to Park City for the luge, bobsled, and skeleton, and to Kearns for the Olympic speed skating oval. What did that tell you about Denver's bid going in, and is Utah thinking at all about having venues that are outside of Utah? 
So, first of all, I congratulate Denver on having Olympic enthusiasm for hosting the Games. They were all in. And they've got a, a spirit of Olympism there that is just admirable. Uh, but for their Games to economically be viable, they had to use others' infrastructure. Otherwise, the numbers don't work. But for us, having a one Games experience where everything is right here and it's so close together, that's what we pitched, and there was never any interest of doing it across state lines because for athletes and the Olympic family or spectators, it's not a great experience. Utah appears to be an ideal place to hold a Winter Olympic Games. Is there any thought to the idea of having uh, the Olympics in a regular location like Utah around the world and not go through this huge bidding process every single time? Yeah, that is a fantastic question because the infrastructure costs for new venues is so significant. Um, and so it's a, a tug between two forces. One is a rational economic argument like you just made. Maybe there are four to six cities around the world where it could go. The other side is the IOC tries to have an openness to the Olympics. Anybody that wants to participate has an opportunity. So far, that is still the outcome that the IOC is focused on, although there have been other discussions which haven't gone anywhere of a rotational basis for hosting the Games. We are 11 years away from a possible Olympic bid, 11 years away from the Olympics coming back to Utah, perhaps. Tell us, if Salt Lake City is picked by the IOC, what is the timetable like? What needs to be done and by when? Yes, yeah, so uh, in the ramp-up process to submitting a bid to the IOC, it's about a year. And during that process, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Contracts for venues, contracts for hotel rooms, a host city agreement. Um, all these pieces need to be put in place, and that can take about a year to do that. Once the games are awarded, then it shifts. And the shift is more towards marketing and signing sponsorship agreements so that we can have the economics to host the games that we need. And that's very achievable. But then we go kind of quiet because we don't want to, other than marketing, because we don't want to spend a lot of money. And then about three years before the games, we really gear up on operations. And what do you do when you gear up? What happens then? Oh boy. So we hire, we start hiring people. Um, by games time, we'll have 50,000 people engaged, either as full-time employees, mostly volunteers or contractors. So people and organization around that are critical. We will put together our plans for each venue, which are very specific. We build a little city at each venue, and so we have to uh, architect that. We have to build it and put that in place. We have to put in technology. We'll spend $100, $200 million on technology with uh, information systems and timing scoring systems. Here's the key to understanding hosting the games. In most companies, you'll have six, seven, eight functions. In the Olympics, 42. Oh my. 42 functions. For example, one is transportation. And we'll manage 5,000 vehicles and five transportation systems within transportation. So it's a massive planning and execution effort. My goodness. It sounds as if Utah really is the poster child for how you do an, Olympics, an Olympic Games. What is the difference between Utah and, say, a Sochi, Russia, or other places that have had Rio de Janeiro, that have had major challenges? Well... I think it starts with the uh, great people here in Utah and adding Olympic experts to that pool of talent. So one of the things I did was made sure we had some prior Olympic experience in all 42 functions. And so that we could have very effective planning and we had a fantastic leader in MIT. And he was a cheapskate and he kept the cost down and we had the we had our costs so well managed that we were able to generate a profit. No other games other than LA has generated a profit, and we did, $100 million, but it was the focus on planning, uh, being effective with our resources, and great leadership. What has been the long-term effect of breaking 
even and creating a profit in 2002. What did that do for the Olympic legacy in Utah? Well, it created two Olympic legacies. One was our reputation around the world. So many of my uh, former staff and myself, we go around the world to help other uh, Olympic cities who are preparing for the games. The second thing is through that surplus, we were able to leave an endowment of $76 million to maintain and operate our legacy venues, unheard of in the world. And so we have every venue that is active, well-maintained, and here this week we have world championships and we're hosting the world again on a smaller basis, but it's because of our great legacy venues. How important is it to attract world events prior to leading up to a Winter Olympics bid, let alone the games? It's critical to host events because what they see is your venues are still well maintained, you still have the base of people to volunteer and operate the games, and you have this spirit of hosting world-class Olympic events. Yes, we can do it. We're ready to host again. Okay, so here's Utah, all set, ready to go. We think we can do it for, what, $1.5 billion, mm -hmm. a fraction of the cost uh, compared to other places. What could go wrong at this point? Well, I think operationally and economically, I don't see much that can go wrong because our risk is so low because things are in place. And we have people who know how to put on the games. Um, so I think compared to any other Olympic city, our risk is a fraction of any other city out there. So, and our budget is so modest that we can make that work. So I see very little risk. I don't see any major thing that could go wrong. If the IOC selects Salt Lake City as the 2030 host city for the Winter Games, how will those games be different from 2002? Oh, it's so exciting because we have all these new disciplines in the various sports. We have big air, which there's massive jumps in these Olympians just fly off that, it's amazing. We have slope style, we have snowboard cross, we have ski cross, we have freestyle skiing. So we have, the, the games have expanded in events by about 40%. And so the look will be very different and the participation, new athletes, new stories, very different from 2002. For those living in Utah, what can they expect? I know uh, you had an army of volunteers before, are you gonna need I would anticipate more people to come and volunteer. Yes, the games have expanded, uh, more events. And so last time we had about 24,000 volunteers between the Olympics and Paralympics, probably need more than that. So, and one of the great ads that we had for our games was hard work, no pay, quick, get in line, you're, you're, you're gonna lose your slot. <laughs> the people who volunteered just loved it. Prior to you and Mitt Romney coming on board for the 2002 Winter Games, the IOC, the whole process between the IOC and the SLOC was rife with scandal. I mean, and, that, and now most recently we've had Sochi, Russia, which ran way over and allegations of uh, graft there. And in Rio de Janeiro, same thing, lots of problems there. The IOC has had a turnover of personnel now. Um, what is to say that the same thing could not happen again here? Well, one of the things the IOC has done is reformed the bidding process. Whereas before, IOC members could just come visit the host city at any time. It's now very disciplined. That doesn't happen. They send a coordination or a, an evaluation commission to come here that's independent of IOC members and make evaluations of this. So the IOC has done the best they can to try and avoid situations like that. Of course, individuals can always act on their own and you can never control all of that. But I think the IOC has done a very good job of trying to control it. The price tag for the Olympics coming to Utah has been quoted as somewhere between a billion and a billion and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. That money would come from sponsorships, from broadcast rights, and from ticket sales. Now, the cost is probably going to go up, as it always does. 
And if it does, then how do you pay for the stuff that the sponsorships, the broadcast rights, and ticket sales don't pay for? Well, the nice thing about our budget of a billion five is it has some built-in cushions. It has $60 million of contingency funds. It has an estimated surplus of $50 million. And it's got some other areas where if we needed to, we could cut back. This is exactly what we did last time, where we cut $200 million out of the budget. We used a philosophy of must-have versus nice-to-have. We spent money on the must-haves. We'd do the same thing here. And then as we got close to the games, if we say, okay, we've got enough money, we'll do the nice-to-haves and we'll really decorate the city and do those great fireworks and things like that. It's all about cost management and discipline. And this time it's easier because we've done it before and we've got everything in place. So we're pretty confident on our budget. You played a critical role in 2002 as the CFO and the COO of the Salt Lake Organizing Committee. Would you be willing to be the CEO? Oh my goodness. In 2030? If I may have to be in a wheelchair by then, but uh, we're just gonna let this thing play out and we have a lot of enthusiastic people. Of course, myself and my former team would love to help and we'll let that sort out in the future. There have been in recent years uh, a number of cities that have opted out of the uh, Olympic opportunity. I'm thinking of Calgary, I'm thinking of where else? Uh, Oslo, Norway, Sion, Switzerland, Graz, Austria. They've all opted out of it when presented with the opportunity. Is, uh, are the Olympics just getting too expensive to put on anymore? Well, there was a trend of costs going way up. Uh, Sochi, Rio, things like that. But the IOC has developed something called the new norm, which is saying, let's identify ways to put on the games more efficiently. And so these cities, the number one reason why they turned it down is because of public investment required. And they said, there are other places where we could put our public money to work. The unique situation here in Utah is we don't need any public money. We can generate a profit without it and still have $6 billion of positive economic impact. So we're in a very unique situation because of our existing infrastructure and what we have today. What happens if Salt Lake does not get the bid in 2030? If it uh, goes someplace else, do we keep trying? Well, we are America's choice. We are in line. Sooner or later, it's gonna come back to North America. And now that Calgary's out, we're kind of the only choice and so it will come back. The question is, would it be 2030? Would it be 2034? One of those two, I'm highly confident we will be the selection. And if you look at it rotating, it's gone from Asia, likely in Europe in 2026 with the two remaining bidders, and then the natural selection would be North America in 2030. You've been involved in the Olympics for decades now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? What turns you on about the Olympics? Well, funny story, uh, when Mitt was put in as CEO of the Olympics, he called me up and said, Fraser, I, I need a COO. And I said, good luck, because it was dark days then. And he said, what about you? And I said, no way. And he twisted my arm subsequent to that, and I joined, and I knew it was going to be an incredibly difficult task. But during those three years of preparation, I fell in love with the Olympic movement. It unites the world in a way that nothing else does. All these countries coming together to compete under the umbrella of sport and meeting each other and opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies together. It's unique in unifying humanity around the world as best we can see. And that's why you love it? That's why I love it. Well, all right then. Well, Fraser Bullock, past COO, CFO of the 2000 Winter Games and now on the Olympic Exploratory Committee for 2030. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. My, per my pleasure, Bob.